use ideas and creativity, even when we don't get to do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me, you simply can't spend enough time on Zoom or YouTube or Crowdcast, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header digital media on our website. But back to today's event. Bob and Shaylin will speak for about 20 minutes, after which I'll return for a short conversation and will eventually segue to your questions using the ask a question field at the bottom center of your screen. This is an emotional issue on an auspicious day, and so when I ask you to consider keeping your questions brief, it's only so that we can get to as many folks as possible. Also know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast and over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that platform's closed captioning feature. Town Hall's adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include an exploration into the history of the local hip hop scene with Dr. Dowdy Abe and Blue Scholars Geologic. Another look at animal intelligence and consciousness from the great Peter Godfrey Smith. A reconsideration of the role of Malcolm X in the black freedom struggle by Tamara Payne, as well as upcoming appearances by Mario Livio, Michael Eric Dyson in conversation with Robin D'Angelo, Andre Gregory in conversation with Todd London, uh, I think still one more show in the Earshot 20 uh, Jazz Festival, 2020 Jazz Festival, and a virtual edition of the Bushwick Book Club, this time featuring all new songs inspired by Eric Liu's Become America. Both of those last two programs will actually be offered live from our forum space. And for more information about all of the above, visit townhallseattle.org. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civics programs are supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you watching likely know, Town Hall is fundamentally a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching. We truly wouldn't be here without your support. One last piece of infomercial. Since you will certainly want to spend more time considering today's topic, I think many, many more years considering today's topic. I hope you'll consider purchasing your copy of the book here today from our partners at Third Place Books. If you keep it local, just maybe the things that we love about this community from before the pandemic will still be around for us on the other side. All right. Bob Putnam is the Malkin Research Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University, having retired from active teaching in May of 2018. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the British Academy, and a past president of the American Political Science Association. In 2006, Putnam received the, and I will mess this up, the Skite, the Skit Prize, Skit Prize, the world's highest accolade for a political science, scientist. In 2013, President Barack Obama awarded him the National Humanities Medal nation's highest honor for cont contributions to the humanities, for deepening our understanding of community in America. And in 2018, the International Political Science Association awarded him the Carl Deutsch Award for cross-disciplinary research. He has received 16 other honorary degrees from eight countries, including 28 in 2018, the University of Oxford. Professor Putnam has written 15 books translated into 20 languages, including the best-selling Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, published in 2000, and more recently, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, released in 2015, which marked the occasion of his last visit to Town Hall. Shailen Romney Garrett is a writer and award-winning social entrepreneur. Her, oh no, I just skidded too far ahead. Her work also includes American Grace, How Religion Divides Us and Unites Us, a series of revealing portraits of religious communities across the United States. American Grace won Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson Award for Best Political Science Book of 2010-11. She's also a founding contributor to Weave the Social Fabric Project, an Aspen initiative, I'm sorry, Aspen Institute initiative with David Brooks. A speaker of Arabic, Shaylin lived in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan for six years, creating an original Arabic language cur curriculum on creativity and critical thinking that was incorporated into Jordanian public schools. She sustains this experience with nonprofit work to this day, including Think Unlimited, a venture promoting social innovation in the Middle East. Putney, a Putnam and Romney Garrett's book is called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. It's a pleasure to welcome Shailen Romney Garrett and Robert Putnam. Thank you both for being here. As we get started, I want to take a moment to share out just one of the answers. You guys wrote some beautiful things uh, in the in the in the chat field, um, but uh, Dwayne said really quite simply, "Don't treat people who disagree with me as the enemy." In response to our simple prompt, um, and so I just I wanted to acknowledge that many of you took the time to share out your impressions and your reflections uh, and to get into the space to, to take on today's, um, uh, today's topic. And, I, and we really appreciate that. Um, 
So, uh, but before we really get into the present tense, I think it's important to really sort of dive into the case of the book. And so Bob, Shailen, tell us a little bit about the basic argument of the book. Well, thanks very much, uh, where it's, uh, first of all, I should say it's uh, a great pleasure to be back at uh, Seattle Town Hall, or at least back in a certain virtual sense. Um, as you uh, indicated, I've been in the real building, the gorgeous building, uh, two or three times in the past. Um, and I, I gather that since I was last there, the building itself has been somewhat changed, although not so much, I think, I've been told, in the... Um, in the space where the speaker is, but but behind the scenes, um, and it's a it's a I, I say it's a pleasure to be back, uh, not merely as a matter of politeness, but because I it's one of the, my favorite places. The space is one of my favorite places to talk uh, in the country, and that's partly because of that marvelous space, the stained glass and so on. But it's partly because of the people. So I'm looking forward very much to our interaction with uh, you. And then with the uh, uh, later on with the with the audience, um, I want I'm going to start off by trying to summarize sort of quickly the basic argument. Well, I'm going to start off. Shailen and I are both going to be summarizing the basic argument. I'm going to start because the first part of what we want to say is um, basically about some statistical evidence that we think is provides the backbone of the, our argument. And then after I've talked for, you know, five or 10 minutes, maybe a little longer, but that's what we're aiming at, um, I'll pass the baton to Shailin, who will pick up the story and um, her argument, our argument will rest on that earlier quantitative stuff, but she'll be talking in a narrative way about, well, what does it all mean? And what do we learn from the argument of this book? Um, if we can have the first, um, the PowerPoint slides, um, I can begin to talk with you through that. Um, as I say, it's really great to be back here. The title of this book is The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and what and How We Can Do It Again. And that strange inverted U-curve that you see on the cover turns out to be central to the book. Uh, let's go to the next slide if we can. And here you'll see um, actually, go back again to the first slide, because what I want to say a little bit is that um, America's in trouble. America's in trouble. Well, we all know that, actually. Um, we've, been, it's been reminded, we've been reminded of that over the last um, uh, couple of weeks or year or five years or whatever. America's in trouble in many respects. First of all, we're very polarized. America, and we, that hardly needs saying on a day like this. America is... Uh, about as politically polarized as it has ever been in our national history. I'll, I'll come back to saying something more about that in a second. But secondly, we're also, America is also very economically unequal. The degree of economic inequality in America, again, is probably almost unrivaled in our whole national history. So we're really, really unequal economically. Thirdly, in sociological or social terms, Americans are remarkably socially isolated at the moment. Um, and again, I'll say more in a minute what I mean by that, but the degree to which Americans are socially isolated has rarely been rivaled, again, in our whole national history. And finally, in cultural terms, Americans are probably more self-centered than we have been, well, certainly in a very long time. And you, you might very well wonder, well, what do you mean by self-centered and how are you measuring culture? And that's exactly the kind of question I'm gonna get into now. So we can have the next slide, please. Um, these, what I'm going to be showing you now is a series of graphs and charts that show trends over the last 125 years, roughly speaking, from the beginning of the 20th century until now we're a quarter of a cent, we're, we're 25 years into the 21st century. We want to take a very long view at what these trends in economics, politics, society, and culture have been like. And so we have a number in the book the book is based on a number of charts that look like this here we're looking at trends in economic equality over this period over at the far left hand side of the chart you can see um down at the bottom you can see around eight the data here don't begin until 1913 which, because that's when the first uh in the internal revenue service was created so it's beginning then that we have good data on inequality in income the kind of measures we're looking at here are measures of 
um, equality or inequality in wealth, that is the amount that we have, uh, our, our capital stock, and also inequality in income, that is the amount we make year by year. Um, and the charts, those charts, or another example, we look at the degree to which uh, there's equal equality of opportunity, the degree to which people can earn more than their parents did or not. All those graphs actually look so much so, so similar that we're able to put them in a single chart. And what you're seeing now is long run trends in economic equality measured in many ways, um, but all of, all those different ways basically con uh, concurring in this basic chart. So you see, for the beginning in, in about 1913 and going up to the about 1920, Americans were connecting, were, were more and more equal actually, still very unequal, but becoming more equal. Then there was a pause during the 20s, um, but then coming out of the 20s and going up through the 30s and 40s and 50s and into the 60s and it then stated equality stated at a pretty high level. America was not perfectly equal, of course not perfectly equal, but more equal than we'd ever been in our national history actually in that in that period that runs roughly from 1940 until roughly 1970. But then you see beginning in 1970 that trend reverses itself and we become less and less equal beginning in 1980, and you can see that goes all the way down to now, to the 19-teens, and actually, if we had in the, in the, on the chart the data up to really right this year, the trend of economic equality would have been, has been plunging even further. So that's an extraordinary uh, century and a quarter there. And, um, and what you can see is the peak basically lasted, the peak of equality lasted from, roughly speaking, the mid 1940s until the mid 19 until the late 1970s um and you may wonder about what explains those little dips and so on up at the top and I'm, i promise you we're going to come back to that let's go to the next slide which looks at politics instead here we use many measures of political polarization or as here we're calling it political comedy that is the degree to which people collaborate across party lines so underneath this chart are measures, for example, of the degree to which um, m members of, of the House and Senate uh, vote similarly or engage in, that is, they vote only as Republicans or only as Democrats, or to the degree to which there's cross-party collaboration in Congress. Uh, that's one of the measures, but there are many other measures. Another measure of uh, political comedy or, or, by contrast, political polarization uh, we're, we're familiar with actually this very week because it has to do with the degree of split party voting, split ticket party voting, to the extent that people vote a straight ticket. That is, they vote the same political party for president and for governor and for dog catcher. That's a very polarized system. And in this most recent election, there was an extreme degree of straight ticket voting. Um, now, if you go to the chart, you can see here that that measured in those ways and many other ways um, beginning in the, begin in the late 19th century, America was extremely polarized. Very little cross-party collaboration, very little um, split-ticket voting, uh, very little uh, trust or respect for people in other parties. But then beginning in about um, 1890, 1895, that begins to, that degree of political polarization begins to decline and po political cross-party collaboration begins to increase. And as you can see, beginning in the throughout the first the 19 uh, hundreds and the 1910s and in the 1915s and so on every year americans getting a little more likely to cooperate with people on the other side of the aisle um and you see you can see that was not a perfectly straight line there's a little bit of that similar um pause in the um in the 1920s but then going up rapidly into the 1940s and 1950s up the very up at the top you can see reaches a peak sort of about 1955. That's the years of Eisenhower, probably the least partisan president in American history. Continues to be pretty nonpartisan until then, beginning about 1970, you see we start having, we start disagreeing more and disagreeing more along party political lines. And you can see beginning in 1970, for the next 50 years, America has become steadily more and more polarized, less and less cooperative across party lines. And once again, if we continue those charts, uh, that chart to the very end of the century, uh, to the very end of this graph to 2020, in fact, there's the polarization has been increasing. And 
probably everyone watching this uh, presentation knows the story from 1970 to now, and because people have been talking about the, great, the growing degree of, of, of political polarization for all that time, many fewer people know what the first half of the chart looks like. Very few people, I mean, political scientists who've been studying it know this, but many, most of us don't know that actually there was a period when America was becoming not more polarized, but less polarized. Mm. And you can see if you compare the bottom uh, from about 1900 to the bottom about uh, 2020, we're about just as polarized, we're about as polarized now as we were then. And I alluded earlier to earlier to measures earlier in our history. The only other period that rivals us, rivals us now and in the in the ninth around 1900 is the Civil War. Um, so we're we're when we say that America is really polarized, we are really polarized. Hardly ever in our history have we been as polarized as this. Let's go to the next slide. This has to do with um, the degree to which we, uh, are, we uh, are socially cohesive, that is the degree to which we have, um, we spend time with our friends, the degree to which we belong to community organizations. Um, and again, you can see over at the left-hand side of the graph, we were pretty socially isolated um, in around 1900. Um, uh, we, were, we were not, many, most of us were not members of community groups. Uh, at that point, America had just come, had been through a big ur urbanization. People had moved from the farms to the cities and the older ways of connecting with your neighbors, you know, quilting bees and, and barn raisings didn't cut it in on the Lower East Side of New York. So that was a period of relatively low community engagement, civic engagement. It also happens to be a period in which we were relatively, um, even our, our, our intimate family, our family formation was pretty low. That was a period in which Americans were likely to, um, uh, many Americans were what was then called um, bachelors or spinsters, and 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 and, brilliant, and many people lived their whole life without having kids. But then uh, that, as well as other these other measures of social co social cohesion, begin to rise in about 1900, 1910. You can again, you can see it's rising pretty steadily. Uh, there's a little bit of a pause there in the in the 20s. You can see that, and then. Um, but then after that pause in the 20s, uh, beginning in 1940, we begin to become much more engaged. We join groups. Probably that was the period in American history when we were most civically engaged of, of ever. It, was a, it seemed to Americans living through that as if, gosh, uh, everybody is, is joining groups all the time and, and they're all getting married and having kids and so on. That was the baby boom period. And that continued until about 1960, 65, and then we're up to that familiar turning point. About 1965, all those measures begin to turn south and people stop going to, going to clubs and they stop uh, voting so much and they stop um, getting married and having kids and so on. And, and again, straight line down to the period we're in now. Um, now you're beginning to notice a certain commonality here. I want to, uh, but before I talk about the commonality across these three charts, I want to go to the next chart, which is um, about cultural change and um, the, cult the degree to which we're culturally connected. I'm hoping we're going to see the next slide. The next slide is called, there we are, great. Um, and this, I'm going to say in a minute exactly how, you, how we measure cultural solidarity, but um, we have a number of interesting measures of cultural solidarity, which I'll be, which you, if you're interested, you can read the book and we have whole, a whole chapter with lots and lots of footnotes as to how we measured cultural solidarity. But what I want to say here is you can see it begins, Americans were very much in what I will want to call a very individualistic, a very narcissistic period culturally around 1890. But then, and Shaylin will say a lot more about what that felt like at the time, but then beginning around at the same turning point, around 1900, um, Americans suddenly begin to be more conscious of the things that we have in common, um, and that, and then we, that rises steadily. Again, you see the same pause during the 1920s. Well, please go back. There we are. The same pause in the 1920s, um, but then coming out of the uh, the Great Depression, and then into the 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, we continued to be more and more conscious of what we had in common and less and less insistent on what, on our, our individuality. Um, and then that same, remarkably, the same turning point, 1964, all those charts turn, all those 
measures of social, social uh, cultural solidarity begin to turn south. And again, we end up down at the end of the period in 2020, uh, very, very low in cultural solidarity, very distrusting of one another, um, very, and then I just mentioned quickly a couple of the measures. Um, one of them comes from a really interesting um, Google app called Ngram. If you look up on Ngram, you can see how which, uh, Google has digitized all books in the world, actually, but in particular, they digitized all American books over this period. And not just academic books, but, you know, um, books about gardening and books and mystery stories and kids literature and so on. And it's, a, it's an interesting cross section of what Americans are writing about and reading about in any given year. And um, one of the measures that we discovered, I discovered more or less by accident, um, was not, I wasn't looking for words like individualism, because individualism, of course, is a book that, is a word that appears only in academic books. And I didn't want to know what academics were writing about. I wanted to know what ordinary people were writing about. It seemed to me the simplest way would be to look at the first person singular pronoun, I, and the first person plural pronoun, we. And it turns out that if you graph over time, this time, the ratio of we to I, just the word we and the word I, the ratio is identical to this graph, exactly this graph. Um, and that's why in the end we come to call this the I, we, I curve, because we start off very much in a, in a cultural, in a period of a sense of national solidarity, of, of national individualism and not national solidarity, then we reach in the in the in in the middle 60s, we reach this period of extreme uh, solidarity. And that's followed by a half century of of uh, growing emphasis on individualism and on our rights and not so much emphasis on our responsibilities. I'm going to not go into any more detail about the measures here because I want to make sure we leave enough time for Shailen to tell you about really what was happening behind these curves and also because we want to leave time enough for questions. But let's go to the next slide, please. And you can see this is how all of those, when you put all those curves on the same graph, it's a remarkable pattern. This is the pattern. You can see the curve there for economics, the curve for politics, the curve for social solidarity, and the curve for for uh, cultural um, solidarity. And, and the remarkable thing is they're the same curve. In every curve, you can even see in almost every curve, you can see the pause, that little pause during the 20s for whatever that was. Um, statisticians, if there happen to be any statisticians in the audience, uh, you may have heard of the uh, famous test of significance. Uh, it's called the uh, statistical significance. It's called the interocular trauma test. Interocular trauma test. It hits you between the eyes that there's something going on. And this chart shows that the charts, the data that we're that we're exploring with you here today um, are remarkably, uh, not just statistically significant, but we think substantively significant. If we have the next slide, this next slide summarizes for us the I, we, I curve. That is the how America has moved from over the course of the last 125 years from a period of extreme individualism to a period of pretty extreme emphasis on community and, so, and, and solidarity and cohesion to now an emphasis on um, economic individualism and therefore economic inequality, political polarization, social isolation, and cultural narcissism. Shailen, that's the background to this story, but tell us what's going on really behind it. Well, first of all, you know, I think when we when we look at this curve, the I we I curve, one of the biggest things that we see is that we've been in a place remarkably similar to the one that we are in today. Um, you see where we are down on that lower end today. It's a, it's a very similar place to where we were back in 1890, 1900. Um, and so there's a couple of lessons from that. But before I go into those lessons about what we really hope people will understand from this historical um, and statistical story, I first want to talk about the American we. Because the first thing that that you might think to yourself when you look at this is, well, okay, if, if that first two thirds of the 20th century were somehow America's we decades and we were building toward this greater and greater sense of we, how does that map onto the story of race in America? Was that simply a white male we or was that actually an inclusive we? And that's an incredibly important 
question, which we address in detail in the book, but I just want to overview here quickly um, what we what we'd like to to our readers to understand about this. So, um, so when we think about race relations in America, there's sort of a, a typical historical story that many people believe, which is that um, given where things were at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, um, it was a time that was an incredibly bleak time for African-Americans in America. Um, just after Reconstruction and during Reconstruction, there had been significant improvements for the Black community. And then following Reconstruction, the South entered a period what, of what historians call redemption, the time when there was a violent reclaiming of white hegemony and, and, and most of those gains from Reconstruction were lost. And then the broader phenomenon that followed was, of course, Jim Crow. Um, and so oftentimes when we think of the 20th century, we think all was oppression, all was stagnation um, and an inequality uh, unchanging for Black Americans for most of the century until the lightning bolt changes of uh, the civil rights movement in, you know, roughly the 1960s. Um, so charted against these inverted U-curves that we've been showing you over and over again, that might look like a hockey stick, right? No change. And then all of a sudden, rapid change toward equality. Well, in many ways that hockey stick image is correct. Of course, when we talk about um, the ongoing lack of equity in political representation, the ongoing nature of white supremacy in mainstream media, um, the delayed entry of black Americans into professional schools and professions, um, residential segregation. So in many ways that hockey stick story is true. But when we zoomed out to that full century and looked at some other measures, measures of material progress, we saw a bit of a different story. So if we can go to the next slide here, um, there's a summary graph of what that story actually looks like. So this is a summary index of black white material equality from 1900 to 2020. So if you're looking at this graph, you'll see a 1.0 at the very top. That represents full equality between blacks and whites. Um, of course, you can see that we've not come anywhere close to full equality, but the progress here in the shape of the curve looks a little bit different than a hockey stick. And again, when we're talking about material equality, we're talking about measures such as life expectancy, infant mortality, um, high school enrollment, high school completion, college graduation, um, average earnings per worker, um, wealth, such as home ownership. We're talking also about voter registration, voter participation. So these are real measures that describe the lived reality for Americans. And what this graph shows is that Black Americans were actually moving toward equality with white Americans more rapidly before the civil rights movement than after, which is a, a surprising finding. Um, and and what this data really reveals is a too slow, of course, and incomplete, but nonetheless decades long trend toward equality. Um, and then that trend you'll notice, right, um, in roughly uh, the 1970s begins to level off, which is actually quite a surprise because that was the same time at which we'd finally dismantled de jure segregation. The Civil Rights Acts had passed. And we would think that if we were already seeing this trend toward equality, that in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, that might accelerate up to full equality, which of course it did not. Um, now, and, and instead what we saw was the, the last third of the century was stagnation. And in many cases, on many of these measures, a reversal of progress, such that on some of these measures, Black Americans are doing worse today that they were, than they were in 1970. So um, what is behind this story? How is it, first of all, that during the period of Jim Crow, Black Americans were making rapid progress toward equality with whites? And how is it that after the civil rights movement, that progress stagnated? Well. The first explanation is, of course, something that Black Americans know full well. Um, it's something that is not always known amongst white Americans, but is definitely, it's part of the family history of many Black Americans, which is the Great Migration. Um, during this first two thirds of the century, Black Americans were leaving the uh, violent and oppressive South for the slightly more hospitable North and were then able to access education and healthcare and voting and, other, and start businesses and do things like that that they were not able to do in the South. Again, they were doing so in separate spheres. So this was a highly racialized we, but it was a moment when Black Americans were standing up and claiming their place within this broader American we of prosperity and civic participation and other things. And then, 
just in this moment when America more broadly makes a turn from we to I, as we saw in those inverted U curves, America takes its foot off the gas in the full drive toward racial equality. Um, and so, you know, the reason that we want to share this story is because it's important, especially for white Americans to understand that it is against this backdrop, this sort of um, quarter century or more backdrop of stagnation that the Black Lives Matter protests are really emerging. Yes, the, the Black Lives Matter protests are directly a response to um, police brutality and po police killings, but there's also an immense underlying frustration in black communities about this intergenerational stagnation that has happened um, in the last generation or two that has also coincided with this moment when America has become more self-focused and more individualistic. Um, one explanation for why this happened is that broader turn toward I, but another is a very clear and present white backlash to the civil rights movement. Um, which caused the other, whether whether the white backlash was caused by this more broad turn toward I or whether the more broad turn toward I was fueled a bit by this white backlash and racial realignment is a little bit difficult to say, but these happened at the same time. And it's an incredibly important part of the story of America's we that we had um, experienced on all of these measures in, in mid-century America, but that was still a highly racialized we. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the lesson here is that, um, you know, when we look at whether this we was inclusive, um, it certainly wasn't. It certainly was not inclusive enough. However, this was also a moment when we really, this this um, first two thirds of the century was really a time when we made broader changes to our economy and to our politics and to our culture that were incredibly impactful. And so um, again, the, the broader lesson, if we could go back to that previous slide, is just that we've been in a mess similar to the one that we've been in today, but the we that we moved ourselves toward was not nearly um, a high enough summit. It was not an inclusive we. And so we, we need to bear that in mind. But also, you know, we want to not, we, so in writing this book, we didn't want our readers to take the lessons from this supposed golden age of the 1960s when we were at this peak of American we. What we're arguing here is not, is that um, looking at a time when trends reach their summit is actually a bit, it's, it's not as instructive as looking at the time when we made the pivot from a situation that was, um, you know, a mess similar to the one that we're in, in today and turn the corner towards something better. And so the question is, what are the lessons not from that period um, at mid-century America when we were experiencing a peak of weakness, but that weakness was highly exclusive, but, but rather what are the lessons for how we turned the corner the last time? So if we could just advance a couple of slides forward here, we have some lessons that we pull from this period. So in that in that 1900s, 1890s, 1900s period, America was, um, historians have referred to that period, um, and Mike, Mark Twain coined this phrase, the Gilded Age, right? A time of great inequality, great division. Um, how did that Gilded Age give way to the progressive era, which is the era that came on the heels when a dedicated group of reformers looked around and said, this is not the America we want to live in, grabbed the reins of history and righted the ship? Well, we're always asked, you know, what are the silver bullets here? What is it that if we did first, we could we could engineer another upswing today? It's a little bit hard to say. One thing we know is that economics actually turns out to be a lagging indicator. Um, some people feel that, oh, if we could just fix the economic inequality, all of these other things, culture and politics would follow. It turns out that that's not the case from the historical record. So where should we put our focus? Well, looking at how the data pairs with the historical record, we see that probably what happened first here was a, a moral and cultural shift. This was a moment when the social Darwinism of the period, the survival of the fittest dog eat dog mindset, gave way to something called the social gospel. When we shifted to a mindset where society was not about um, competition and getting mine and, and greed, society was about creating a situation where we took care of our most vulnerable. And there was a clear call amongst the progressives for that shift in our primary conceptions, a shift in what our society was really about. There was a real moral indignation 
of the period, not just directed outward, but also directed inward, because many of the people that were leading this shift were themselves chastened elites who realized that they had been complicit in building this highly e unequal and highly divided society. Another lesson was that many of the reformers of this era were incredibly young. They were under the age of 30 when they began agitating and calling for change. This was an incredibly youth-driven movement. And because it was um, youth-driven, uh, it was an incredibly innovative. Uh, there was a lot of a huge groundswell of grassroots innovation, of local problem solving that eventually the successful projects that were created at the neighborhood level and at the level of the tenement and the level of the city ultimately bubbled up into things that became programs that could be adopted on more of a national level. So that's another uh, lesson here was that the solutions didn't really come from the top down. They came from the bottom up. There was an incredible upswell of grassroots problem solving. These progressives also viewed association as both an end and a means. As Bob mentioned, um, there had been a vast shift out of, of small towns and farms and into the cities. People were lonely, they were isolated, and they realized that they needed to invent new ways of bringing people together. And they did so. They invented um, tons of different civic associations, many of which had a service orientation. And they, as a result, they created vast stores of social capital that then fueled this upswing for decades to come. So the grassroots innovation was not just about solving problems like inequality or, or other thing, or you know, child labor or you name it. It was also about bringing people physically together, relationally together to help understand each other. Finally, um, the charismatic leadership of this period really lagged. A lot of times when we talk about the progressive era, we think of Teddy Roosevelt, but he came at the, at the later end of this period. It was not a situation where we elected the right leader and suddenly everything changed. No, the change began at the grassroots and then um, enterprising politicians came along and developed programs that, that could be accepted across party lines, but that came later. So today the lesson might be, you know, we shouldn't, even though a, a change in, in political power and at, in change in the White House is incredibly important to America's story right now, it's not the whole story and it's not going to be the thing that changes everything. It certainly wasn't during this last, um, this last upswing. And as I touched on before, the we was certainly not inclusive enough. In many ways, these progressives that we laud as having sort of saved America from, from our last downturn were incredibly racist. A lot of the um, systemic racism that we are seeing critiqued today was knit into the programs that these progressives built. It was simply true that their circle of moral concern was not wide enough. So any upswing that we would hope to engineer today, it has to have a moral and cultural language behind it. It has to involve youth in an incredibly important way. It has to bring people back together. It has to start at the grassroots and it has to take inclusion as its first and most important project. Um, so if we can just go to the last slide here, um, even though Teddy Roosevelt came toward the end of this period, when he first assumed the presidency in 1901, he said this, the fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others, is that on the whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. Those words turned out to be prescient because this curve, this inverted cur U curve, the I, we, I curve was just beginning right when he said this. And it is true that Americans, our fate is bound together. When we are in an I moment, we have all sorts of negative externalities from that. And when we pull together as a we, we see um, lots of positive things happening in our society. Today, we're in another I moment. And the question is whether we can learn from the past and enter another upswing. Thanks, Shailen. I'm, I'm about to turn it over to you, uh, where, uh, except to notice that actually we didn't plan to give this talk on this particular day, but the, but maybe the message of the last slide is relevant. Um, neither on the left nor on the right do we think, to, be, to begin with, we don't, we think, we happen to think that Trump has been pretty bad for America, but what our uh, study shows is this is not a story that began with Trump, and he it, and and if Trump departs from the scene, we'll still have the same problem. It's a it's a problem of it's a structural problem, not just a personality problem. And secondly, what follows from that is, even if Biden turns out to be a a, a great president, it 
that is not what's going to determine whether this is, is an endure, whether we're in a, an enduring pivot. What will it determine whether we're in an enduring pivot is, is the kind of grass move stuff that we saw in the previous progressive era. Thanks very much for letting us share these thoughts. And let's hear now where from you and then from some of our, uh, some of the other participants, the other witnesses about what questions they would have about this study. Thank you both. And uh, I apologize in advance. There is a construction project happening outside of our windows. So if, if you all hear extra noise, that's what's, that's what's going on. Um, uh, my questions are, that was so rich and so dense that my questions are a little bit scattershot and I'm gonna tap dance across the top of your presentation and hope that the audience um, helps provide some, um, some cohesion. But, I have to start, um, it sure sounds to me like um, the catalyst for it all is, is this notion of shared moral indignation, right? And, and how, how is that something that one engineers when there's plenty of indignation around? And, and I, I, I feel like so many of us thought, or perhaps it was just uh, um, an overripe media narrative, but so many of us felt, I think, that, that the response to the George Floyd killing reflected finally a kind of a transpartisan sense that something fundamental had to change. And the, it lensed so narrowly down around policing and, and understandably, because that that's the origin point of the moment. Sure. Um, but that, that it felt, felt to me that something that had the potential to truly transcend partisanship and pull us together in that kind of catalytic moment of moral indignation pretty quickly devolved into poorly chosen fra you know, phrasing perhaps from the left around defunding police and, and, you know, and a politician who was able to take advantage of it and, you know, and turn it into this like law and order message around a campaign at any rate. That's the last glimpse I've had in my lifetime of a moment that seemed like it could be the kind of shared moral indignation you talk about. So how is it, how can we engage in upswing without a natural, without that happening on its own, without the kindling of that? Does that make sense? It does. I'm gonna let Shailen answer it, except I can make an ageist point and I hope you'll forgive me. Um, it's just a true fact that in nobody living, that's what our graph shows. Nobody living has experienced that kind of moral, cultural reawakening. So it's not surprising you say you don't remember ever having had it. That's what our graph showed. We haven't had that. Yeah. And, and therefore, you ask a very good question, which is, oh, well, how do we do it now? How did they do it? And I, Shailene, why don't, you, why don't you say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I would say that's such a great question. And um, historian Richard Hofstetter, who's written about the progressive era at length, called this moral awakening at that time, moral indignation directed inward. And I think what we see today is a lot of moral indignation directed outward. We're, we're pointing the finger at the idle rich or at the police or at whomever it is, who is the one who, you know, the group that has caused the downfall of America. And I'm not saying that that's not accurate, uh, certainly, but I think there's also a way in which every single one of us has been complicit in constructing a culturally individu individualistic society that prioritizes the I over the we. There's not one of us in this room or in this virtual space that doesn't do that, right? The measures all show, right? That that's where we are culturally as a society. And so in a way we need to get past the issues to, the, to what um, the social gospeler from this previous period called our primary conceptions. He said that it was idle to imagine that changing our governmental machinery or the organization of our industries would bring us peace, but that we had to get down deeper. We had to do what I like to call the heart work. And that's the harder work by far. I think that this election has shown that, uh, that by, you know, there, a majority of Americans are repudiating this immoral president, but we have not yet done the heart work. And when we do the heart work, I think we will see the moral threads that go across all of these issues. And that's what happened in the progressive era. It didn't become just about the issues. It became about what we fundamentally wanted our society to be about. And to just, I, I've gone on a long time, but I'll just add this. I do think I that, I do think we need, you know, because you, your question was how, right? Yeah, exactly. I do think we need leadership from our religious communities. I really do. In this 
previous, I mean, America is a religious society, less so perhaps than ever before and more diversely so than ever before, but we are a religious nation, right? And, and I do think that there is space for our religious leaders to say, wait a second, you know, especially I think amongst evangelical Protestants to say, I think we've, we've gotten it a bit off here in terms of um, which morals were prioritizing from the gospels. And that's exactly what the social gospel movement did at this other time. It, it was a movement from evangelical Protestants to say, we need to refocus our interpretation of morality back toward the Sermon on the Mount, right? Let's get back to the basics. And I live in Utah, which is a highly religious community. And the most inspiring things that I'm seeing here are people doing exactly that. People who have traditionally voted Republican, many of whom who voted for Trump in 2016, who are stopping and saying, wait, I think that some of our moral, moral priorities have gotten out of whack here. And that inspires me that maybe there's some hope from the religious community to see some of this language. There's this, this is happening as well. The, the um, Reverend William Barber, who is leading the moral marches on Washington, picking up the threads of Martin Luther King's poor people's campaign. There is a real, there is leadership coming from, and even from sort of new age spaces, right? Um, giving us language around how to be one, how to be united and how to prioritize that. So I think that that's a, an important place where this is gonna come from. Yeah, I, I, I know we have other, you will have other questions where, but I, I can't forbear from just adding two last little, uh, two last points. The first is on this question of, of religion, how, how can we have a, a, a sense of a moral reawakening without religion. Actually, Eric Liu, who's one of, uh, who's a wonderful person in Seattle and a good friend, I don't know if Eric's watching, but Eric is a superstar in, in civic engagement. And Eric has, uh, what are they called? Something- Civic Saturdays. Civic Saturdays. You all know that we had one two hours ago. I did see that. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So in this so same part, virtual space. <laughs> right. so that's part of our answer to the question, what do we actually do practically? I do want to say one more thing, because, uh, and I know, Shailen has this in mind too. There are actually things we can do, that is practical things we can do that begin to focus um, uh, kids, especially we're focused on kids. It's not that, by the way, it's not that the kids cause this problem at all. We're not, we're saying the last thing is the kids cause the problem, but they're the hope. And mm -hmm. I think part of the hope are things like national service. Part of the hope is civic education. That is, that's, that's, if you say we've got to have a moral awakening, it sounds a little bit airy-fairy, but there are actually particular things that we could do, we go on greater length of the book, that would actually begin to encourage this younger generation. I've got to be really careful. I don't mean that they should be more moral, but I think that they can help the rest of us lead into a period in which there is a moral re reawakening. I know it sounds very airy-fairy, but actually, if you look hard at the data, we think we're not going to actually make a significant pivot, we may get a different government for a while, but we're not going to make a significant pivot until we figure out ways to have this, this moral character reawakening. Um, and I can say from my own experience that um, uh, there's, a, there's just an essential difference, I think, in the outlook of so many young people and creating the space and the capacity for them to set, set the agenda for their voices to be heard and for is, is, in my own observation too, uh, my greatest hope for the kind of change that you're talking about is for those of us sort of who have the mantle of leadership now to be able to create um, space for them to actually show us the way. Right. Um, I, I wanna pose two more quick questions uh, and buy more time for more. I've noticed a couple of the great things that are already being populated. Um, but just picking up a little bit on, uh, on, on moving back toward we, uh, you know, in the same way that I, or in a similar way that I was optimistic from all of that darkness um, uh, back in early June, um, uh, back in March, uh, the the as as we sort of sunk into the pandemic, um, and and uh, by April or early May, I guess when you know after initially being told for good reason, but unfortunately to bad effect, that we should avoid mat wearing masks. The consent, the scientific consensus came around to this notion that we should wear masks and that the motivation wasn't so much to save yourself as to save the people around you from what you might, from the contagion that you might introduce into the community. And um, uh, that's a message that, you know, has received obviously greater degrees of adoption around the country and that, of course, was also seized upon and manipulated by moral, by, by, by political leaders 
um, toward different ends. But that to me felt like a test that we failed where there was this moment, there was a moment for we um, yes. that where, where tribalism either that was intrinsic to, to societies it's currently constructed or where leaders kind of took it and ran with it um, sort of took away a moment where we could have actually sort of reestablished a little bit of that we. And I just wondered if you, without overly assigning blame or anything, wanted to reflect a little bit about how that happened, how we lost that little moment of, of possibility there. I, um, Shailen, can I um, uh, start off on that? As you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And I, I apologize. It's a, it's a hugely important question where and it's one actually we've spent a lot of time talking about. It. And I don't want to get very academic on you, but I just a yeah. tad bit academic. Let's hear it. <laughs> um, the the um, the fact the character of this particular disease is such that solving it involves a dilemma of collective action. That is a, this or what is called prisoner's dilemma. That is to say, it's good for me if you wear a mask. It's good for you if I wear a mask. But I, but wearing, I mean, exaggerating a little bit, but I don't gain anything from my wearing a mask and you don't gain anything from your wearing a mask. That's a classic prisoner's dilemma. And if you look actually at the history of this epidemic, you can see that the places that are, if I can put this this way, the more we like places in America have actually had a better success in fighting the epidemic. And than then, then I like places, but more important, this goes to the I, we, I curve. This pandemic, just by accident, caught us in our most I moment. Mm -hmm. That is, it caught us in a period when we were most deaf to the claims of solidarity mm -hmm. and most attuned to the, the claims of our individual interests. So that's, I mean, it isn't that, you know, it wasn't destined to be that way. The, first of all, the epidemic didn't have to, not all epidemics have this character, but this epidemic does have, this germ, this virus has that, has has to be treated in a we-like way. And we face the just the terrible accident that this epidemic hit us in our most eye-like moment. Does that make sense, Where It makes utter sense. Yeah, it makes sense. And if I could just add, I mean, I think, mm -hmm what we're calling for when we're talking about an upswing is we're calling for a pivot. It's unrealistic to think that all of a sudden we would be this we society, you know, right. because we realize we should wear masks for each other. Like what this is, is a moment to learn. Oh, wow. We really are an individualistic society. We need to start seeing just, you know, what we're looking. I mean, you saw those curves, right? It took 70 years for that I to fully transition toward a we, and even even and then it was an, it was a racially exclusive we, right? And so this this thing will take a long time to sort of get to the conclusion that we all want to see. But the question is, are we going to be part of those pushing it upward, or are we going to be part of those saying, "No, I'm fine down here where I am." That makes sense. I'm going to pose one more question, and it's because I have not been able to figure this out, and I'm going to reach way back to one of the first things you talked about, Bob, which is the notion of, of um, being at this place where um, straight ticket voting has never been more extreme or more um, more acute. Um, so I'm gonna ask the sort of dumb question then, how do we explain Republicans retaining, likely retaining the Senate, actually increasing their margins in the House, um, retaining so many state legislatures, but losing the presidency, losing the top of the ticket? I, in, in, on initially looking at the, the results as they were unfolding, I was just the littlest bit heartened that it felt like a moral rep a repudiation of immorality at the top, but an assertion, listen, don't get carried away, liberals, I'm still a conservative, right? But I agree with you, this person has to go. That was my sort of enthusiastic, re uh, 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 eager <laughs> read. Uh, to think that that that's the, the, but I must be missing something about what, how how it could at a time of such straight ticket voting it could play out that way. Do you have thoughts? Being a better data person than I am. Well, <clears throat> uh, first of all, <laughs> another one of these accidents is we did not expect to be uh, talking about this book at this on this day. So we are, I'm catching you <laughs> on the the cusp of the of the moment. <laughs> so. so I think neither of us is quite prepared to say 
at this hour, actually. So what does this all mean? What does this this uh, election that we've just been through the last several days, what does it mean? How does it fit into our, our story? Um, so if, if you'll allow me that uh, course, little course, um, escape, course. I do want to say that my initial take, at least, is that um, the this election was a real, re a real rejection of Trump. That Trump really um, was rejected. I don't. But there are people who didn't reject him, but there were a lot of people um, who, were nevertheless, remained loyal Republicans yeah. despite him. And the straight ticket voting reflected that Republican loyalty. That is still we're still in a period in which Republican or Democratic. I don't mean to be blaming this on the Democrats. Yeah. Republican party loyalty is still extremely strong. Hence the straight ticket voting. Even in the, but but of course Trump lost, and and my initial take is well, that suggests that tr that this that Trump was kind of um, not really relevant to the bigger trend that we're talking about here. I've said before we don't think, and that I, and we do, we don't. As you look at the data, Trump did not cause this. Trump right. was a terrible a terrible meteor that was passing through our universe and made things really worse. And I'm not saying that, that getting rid of you is not is, is irrelevant. I'm not saying that at all. But we're looking, remember, our book is about deeper change, not what happens from one year to the next, but what right. happens from one decade to the next. Right. And therefore, I, I, it sounds like I'm saying I don't care whether Trump is president or not. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you really if you're really focused on the long term trend, you think if you really think America has been in, to some extent, Trump was the consequence of this. If you really mm -hmm. want to get us into a better position, I think probably you've got to be looking more at longer term trends that we're talking about and not say, well, now we've got rid of Trump, we've got it fixed. Does that Absolutely. make sense? No, I just was curious about that, just trying to wrap my head around that phenomenon based on the, sure. the one point you made. That's, sure. I don't yeah. disagree that it's, that this, we're at the, we're at a, 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 a choice moment uh, where we get to decide as a society who we want to be going forward. And that's, that's right. if Tom Paul personally is devoted to anything, it's about, that idea that that we can all make a choice about the kind of society we want to share together, and the time to start yeah. is tomorrow. That's that's a, and Shane and me want to say this. That idea that things are not determined, but that it's up to us that we can make our own choices. If there's a single message in our book, it's that that we have people have agency. Shane, you're much more articulate about that than I am. Yeah, I mean, we often get asked, you know, uh, well, isn't it just some crisis that causes solidarity? And isn't it, you know, isn't it a war that would, we would need to bring us together? Well, you know, this book clearly shows it was well before World War II. It was even well before the Great Depression that these trends started to turn in a better direction. And during the progressive era, there was no war. There was no vast, you know, national crisis on the level of a Great Depression. Um, this was a this was a result. Of, of of morally chastened reformers choosing a different path and doing so by the millions, right? And so I do think that it is possible to choose. And the other misconception about this book is that there's some sort of pendulum that we're sort of, or some sort of roller coaster that we're riding. We've And we've gotten all the way to the bottom. And so it's sort of inevitable that it's gonna come back up, right? Well, certainly not. I mean, we could get more polarized. We could get more unequal economically. And whether or not that happens is less about who's in the White House and more about what each of us is doing, frankly, in our own neighborhoods, in our own localities, right? to begin to solve these problems of tribalism and misunderstanding, as well as, um, you know, problems of, you know, whatever uh, attitudes are underlying um, the economic inequality, the poor unworthy, and I deserve everything that I get, whatever it is, right? That's where we need to start to rethink. Yep. I have uh, been a mic hog and I apologize and I'm going to take, oops, I'm going to take this opportunity Sorry, <laughs> uh, to uh, click a different button. <laughs> click the button that says ask a question um, and turn to the questions that our audience has posed. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you for indulging me uh, in that time. So uh, this person did not tell us their name. Um, why, um, why wasn't World War II a peak of community, mil military service, drives for materials, war bonds, et cetera? And why wasn't the 60s a low for community, Vietnam War protests, race riots, et cetera? You want to talk to 
<laughs> you like to talk about the 60s, so you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, part of the answer was, well, so let me be a little more specific. Shailen explained why World War II can't be the main explanation here, because these trends begin 20 or 30 years before World War II was in anybody's mind, and right. they and they and the trends continued going up for 20 or 30 years after World War II. So that's part of the answer. I would certainly concede, we do in the book concede, World War II did have an effect on, on solidarity. And you can see that if you look in detail at our charts, we haven't shown these in detail here, but if you look at our charts, there was a little extra bump um, because of all those war bond drives and the victory gardens and so on. We were, World War II did in, uh, occasion a special focus on connection, but the larger point about, about that war is that is not what was mainly driving these big trends. What was driving the big trends was something deeper than that. Secondly, about the 60s, I could go on forever in the 60s. You, you will note, we chose not to write a book about the peak. We chose to write a book about the earlier valley, so to speak. And that's because we didn't want to write a book. There are a lot of these books that kind of, you know, nostalgic, wasn't life great back in the golden age of the 60s and so on. And that's not the kind of book that we wanted to write because we wanted to we wanted to look forward, not backward. Um, but there's more to say. We have a whole chapter on the 60s. And since I actually am a creation of the 60s, that is, I, I went, to, uh, rather, I'm a creation of the first half of the 60s. If we get deeply into the 60s, which I'm not going to allow myself to do here, though I would love to do it, the 60s was divided into two parts. The first half of the 60s, uh, up to about 1964, was um, a time of, of that the, was the culmination of, of this long increase toward community. That was the warm hands, the cuddly feelings, the communes, the, you know, the, the folk singers with their, their, um, you know, uh, evocations of community and so on. But then beginning about 1964, it's actually in some respects, you could almost in the, in the music, you could date this almost to the month at which this happened in the, in the sphere of pop culture. Um, it's, it's sort of the late 19, about 64, 65, that period. Um, we suddenly, the whole country kind of does a backflip and comes out of the 60s in the act, in the opposite direction. And by the by 1970 or 71, 72, Tom Wolf calls um calls the 70s um the I decade. Uh, she I've forgotten the name of that essay. The but the mm -hmm. the decade, right. Um, so there's no question that that happened. And if you start, if you ask people who were around then uh what was the cause of it. Um, there are many, there's not just one, there are many different explanations uh, that people cite. People a little older cite the assassinations. Um, uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King, Kennedy, and they're convinced that that's what really caused it. People a little bit longer, uh, for, uh, long, further along um, will cite this, the Vietnam War, um, but some other people will cite the Civil Rights re um, Revolution and the backlash of the Civil Rights Revolution and I'm listing things, and what I'm trying to say is they weren't actually in our, if you live through the 60s, you think of them as one thing, but they actually were conceptually quite different things. There were, the drug, the drugs um, uh, were an important part of that. And um, it changed sexual mores uh, with the pill and so on. But the, there was no necessary connection between the pill and Vietnam or between the assassinations um, and drugs. I mean, there were some drugs. In, but so what I'm trying to say is, the 60s were the moment. It was a concatenation <clears throat> of trauma. But there was no single event during the 1960s that basically brought all this on. I would, I can't tell you how much I would love to go on talking about the 60s. I would even love to sing some of the songs of the 60s <laughs> to illustrate that change, but I'm going to forego that pleasure. It did sound like you were going to give us a particular album or single release that you marked as the pivot point, but you can. Well, maybe. well, 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 now you've given me a chance. You've given me a chance. Um, uh, I'm going to take the Beatles. There are a lot of examples, actually. I'm going to take the Beatles. Um, uh, the very last song that the Beatles recorded um, uh, uh, as a group, um, I'm going to I'm going to sing for you the crucial lyrics of the very last song that they reported as a, they sang as a group. I, me, my, I, me, my, I, me, my, I, me, my. That was a song that was written, I think it was a George, George Harrison. Harrison song. 
Um, and, uh, and he was really angry because John Lennon was about to leave the group and enter into this I period. And um, six weeks later, Lennon's first single, now I'm not gonna be able to remember exactly the, the, the lyrics, um, uh, but his, it, the, the, the core message of that first single by John Lennon was, I've had enough with the, with the Beatles, I'm interested in me. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the, I'm sorry, I'm not really good at producing the exact no. words. What I'm trying to say is, you can, and I, I could do the same thing for for um, for Pete Seeger and, and and the folk rock thing and so on. It's a it's a fascinating example, actually. You, now you're now you're letting me indulge myself. The '60s are really interesting, but they didn't attract our attention as scholars because we were interested more in how to not how to get out of uh, of we society, but how to get in back toward a we society. Back into it. Uh, I'm going to take two more here because you picked up on Carolyn's question, actually, with that answer. Um, Peg wants to know, how much do you think is leadership example? Um, actually, I don't understand that sentence. We hear about Reagan and O'Neill meeting at least weekly to talk over a whiskey. It seems that 1992 was um, uh, the divide and political leaders cooperating, talking with each other. How can that be rekindled? Hmm. And you want to. How can that be rekindled? Um, well, Sorry, let me. I, I I'll get while you're saying. I want to set the frame for that. Shana, yeah. For you. Um, those Reagan and and um, I mean, you know, the tradition of of bourbon solving problems goes way back, much much earlier. I mean, that, Eisenhower was a purveyor of 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 um, whiskey to some Democrats who were, you know, to Rayburn and and um, Johnson was a purveyor of whiskey to people he wanted to persuade. And um, and and the Reagan so the Reagan um, Tip O'Neill period was of a piece with that, um, and um, but it was it was a piece of the time. That's what we want to say. That is, even as late as Reagan, leaders were talking to one another. They of course didn't agree. I mean, in none of those cases did they agree, but they had a they. That's what was characteristic of the partisanship of that period. It was an open partisanship. And it's it's a little bit like what some people are imagining could happen now between Biden and and um, and the and the leader of the Senate, oh. Mitch McConnell. I am actually myself. Maybe that'll happen. I'm here. My here. Our data is, is just it constricts my imagination. I think we are so far into this polarization period that even if Biden and and um, and McConnell themselves are of a sort of a mind to to do you know more bourbon drinking or whatever, I just can't see it happening. That's that's because we're so deep into this, this polarization period. But Shannon, are you more hopeful than I am? You know, I was listening uh, to some of the news coverage and they had John Meacham on, who's of course a, fast and a, a, a fantastic presidential historian. And he was talking about, you know, how sometimes we have leaders that lead and sometimes we have leaders that just mirror who we are. Yeah. Right. And I think, um, I think Trump has been a mirror. And I yeah. think the hope is that Biden will be a leader. And I think, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, he's 70, you know, what is he, 74 years old? Oh, um, oh. And how, <laughs> oh, yeah, so, you know, how sad to have a septuagenarian in the in the presidency. And, you well, know, I agree, I'd love to see- <laughs> I'd love to see some young energy, right? Who wouldn't? But at the same time, the one great thing about him being of that age is that, Within living memory, this trend of polarization was going in the opposite direction. Right. Biden remembers, as Bob does, a time when we did not have the political culture that we have today. They lived it. It's not just an idea that's in the data or in the historical record for them. And I do think that matters. Whether he can change that overnight, again, I think is unrealistic to think that he could just suddenly get Mitch McConnell to change his mind over a drink, but could he begin to show us the way again? Again, we're looking for the beginning of that curve, not the culmination of that curve. Could he be the beginning of reminding us of a different way politics could be done? Possibly, possibly. And again, we don't wanna just re rewind the clock to this old boys club of all white men sitting around making decisions, right? There's gonna be a lot here about whether Biden can bring in the skills from that former period, but do so amid a cabinet that is fully diverse and representative. So there's a lot going on here as to whether sure. or not 
you know, as to what's going to happen to overcome this polarization. But hopefully we'll see a leading edge of it in this coming administration. We're invited, we're invited back next week. Yeah. I'd love to. I'd, and maybe I'd, the week after that and five months email. after that. Um, I'm going to try to take one more question just because I did monopolize so much of it. And I apologize for that. Um, Nan has been very patiently waiting to ask what your research has suggested about any way to address the gulf between rural and urban areas that is so evident right now. And is that baked in that geographical challenge um, or is there something that you might propose? Why don't you start that, Bob? Well, it's uh, it's a good question. Nan, Nan, is that the name of the person who asked me? I don't see the names of the people. Um, it's a it's a very good question. Um, my and I haven't thought about it in the contemporary context. It is not accidentally a lot. Of, so much of what's happening today has direct parallels back in this earlier period. And remember, the urban rural split was exactly what was at the core of, the, of many of the earlier conflicts in 1890. It was the rural folks who were. Um, unhappy and felt that they were being disregarded and disrespected and left behind by the by the cosmopolitans. Um, that, that's in, in the big cities. That's exactly what was going on, and that is. I hate to keep saying this, but that's not an accident. That that was a problem. Now, how did that evolve then? Well, what it evolved in then actually was there came to be political alliances between parts of the rural area and parts of the urban area. Um, so uh, in that particular, I'm not saying this is tr the right way to think about it now, but in that period, um, lots of farmers turned out to have shared interests with, with um, union organizers because they were both at the mercy of big monopolies. In that case, the monopolies were, of course, the railroads. Now, I don't want to say it's directly that, that's directly analogous, uh, analogous here, but it's not an accident that that period worried about uh, excessive concentrations of economic power. A key issue then was monopoly and and um, and and uh, you know control and a monopoly legislation. And it's certainly not an accident that that's back on the agenda now. It's a different industry, of course, because it's no longer the railroads; it's high tech. That's and it's uh, you know Elizabeth Warren, my my senior senator here in Massachusetts is perfectly aware, utterly aware of this parallel. And she is, many of her proposals um, uh, for economic, for serious economic reform are drawn explicitly her, by her from that 1900, 1910 period. So I don't quite know exactly how to make the analogy or how to, what inference to draw from the earlier period for the urban rural split here but I do think that the evidence is quite clear that there are a ton of even pretty detailed lessons that we can learn today from that earlier period. Shailen, you wanna wrap I, up? I here? do, because I think, Bob, what you've said is exactly right. And you've highlighted some of the top-down initiatives that maybe brought um, the urban and rural divide together, like trust busting, yeah. but they were also bottom up. I mean, I think one thing is that rural America needs to be reminded that they have been the source of many of the solutions to a lot of Americans' problems. And the one that we love to highlight is the public high school. Go for it, yes. You know, public high school. So, so part of this vast um, shift of the Industrial Revolution at that period was that suddenly families were realizing that um, it was inadequate that the, that the level of publication, public education they had access to was inadequate, that their children needed a secondary education to succeed in an industrialized economy. And so what did they do? Well, they actually invented a solution called the public high school. Mm -hmm. They came together and they said, well, I, my kid needs a, um, a better education and your kid and his kid. And well, maybe we should pool our resources here and create a secondary education for everyone. They passed local tax initiatives, they banded together so that they could create a school for every kid in town. And they funded that themselves. That wasn't given to them by the federal government. That wasn't some policy wonk from Washington who came around and solved that problem. We have the same problem in rural America, in suburban America today, specifically even the same problem around education and our, the feeling that our kids are undereducated for the technological shifts that have happened in our economy. Do we, do we have to look to Washington to solve those problems or can we look to each other to come up with we solutions 
local solutions to these problems. And then those public high schools that were created in small town America in the Midwest, in small town America, went viral over the course of 10 to 20 years. And suddenly, within two decades, every community in America had a public school. Imagine what that kind of solution would look like in America today. That's what an upswing looks like. And I think the more that we can empower everyone, whether they're rural, whether they're suburban, whether they're urban, to look right outside their doorstep, look their neighbors in the eye, figure out what problems they share together and what solutions they can come up with together, that's what's going to fuel an upswing. That's what we have to realize. And that's what we mean when we say no charismatic leader can solve this. It didn't happen then and it won't happen now. But I do think that somehow we have to remind people that they, we do have power, power that's latent, power that's hidden, power that has been has been ignored or where we've expected for too long that solutions to any problems are going to be offered to us by corporations or by government. We have to somehow be reminded that there is this well of untapped power in each of us that we need to find access to again. I, 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 that's, if we can, that's a terrific place to end the conversation. Don't worry, I'm about to. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I wanted, I wanted to use that because it summarizes the book. Okay. If we have one single lesson, it is we are not the prisoners of history or anybody else. We have agency. The people in, the, in this earlier period, they could have been drifting along you know, drifting along with history. But in fact, they reached out and said, no, we're going to master the currents of history. And that idea that we have it within our power, it's not determined by something way out there, whether it's Harvard professors or or people in Washington or, or big corporations. I mean, they have influence, of course, but the history of this whole period shows people have agency. That's the one thing we want our readers and young people have agency. They don't need to be cynical. They they have it within their power to change the course of this whole darn country. That's what we want them to do. And that agency becomes power when it is coordinated together. Yep. As that Teddy Roosevelt quote, we will go up or down together. Uh, Bob and Shaylin, it feels like I, we couldn't have scripted a better way to spend our afternoon uh, th this particular afternoon and to think about how we can all be uh, complicit and um, cooperative in charting a new course for this society. Um, and I want to thank you both for your perspective and your generosity and especially, frankly, for your optimism. That's really what I needed to, to hear myself today. Um, the book that you have been telling us about is called The Upswing, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again. Um, try to track back everyone to the little homily I gave about why it's important to buy from third place books and then press that green buy the book button at the bottom of your screen and make it so. And um, Bob, Shailen, thank you so much for being with us and everyone will see you again soon. Have a great Saturday. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.